Hi, welcome to Games Media Team. My name is Savinia and this is Peter. Today I'm very happy to teach you and give you tips on how to play Project Elite. Designed by Konstantinos Kokinis and Sotiris Antilles and published by Kamen. I've discovered this game thanks to Tom Vassell at the Dice Tower and he was so excited about it, I bought it on the spot. And my, I was not disappointed. Project Elite is the most hectic cooperative game I know. If you enjoy this video, don't forget to subscribe and click the like button and the bell to get notified when I post new videos. It helps a lot. In Project Elite, you play an elite squad of up to six space marines tasked to stop an invading alien force. Every round gets increasingly more intense as you compete in frantic rounds of real-time combat while the game activates hordes of aliens and their scary bosses. You move, search for weapons and items and fight to stop the incoming swarm of aliens. You win the game when the mission has been successfully completed and all the heroes are together in the elite starting area. If any hero loses all its lives, or if any alien figure moves into the elite starting area, or if the eighth game round ends and the mission has not been successfully completed, you are defeated. Start by choosing one side of the map board and place it in the middle of the table. Then each player picks a hero, its dashboard and its figurine. Today I'll play a four player game, so we'll pick four heroes. It's best if you agree as a group, as each hero has a unique skill. It's better if they complement each other. If you pick Kara, take the six Kara ability tokens and place them near her board. Then pick a color. Pick its corresponding damage token and the base of the figurine. Place the damage marker on the leftmost slot on the damage track of the hero dashboard. Put your hero's figurine on its base and put it in the starting area. Take one player aid card, four action dice and three hit dice. Now it's time to get some starting weapons. Randomly, take basic weapons equal to the number of players, plus two. All weapons have one or two dice slots. They represent the dice result required to activate it so those with one icon are easier to use. On the bottom left is the weapon's range, from one to three spaces. On the bottom right, you have the number of attack dice it rolls for damage and what you need to roll to hit. You want as many dice as possible and a low hit value. Select as a team one weapon per player. Place your weapon here or here. Heroes can carry a maximum of two weapons. If during the game you find more weapons, you decide which two to keep. Return the two unused ones back to the box. Place the three swarm stat cards face up near the board for all to see. Take all the boss spawn cards, that's the eight boss cards and the 12 all clear cards, shuffle them and then place them in a deck face down near the board. That's your boss spawn deck. Then separate the search cards, alien tech cards and swarm spawn in three decks. Shuffle each of them and place them near the map. Now you need to choose a mission and a difficulty level. There are different types of missions. Extermination, capture, demolition, recon, exploration. They all have a clear objective. How you set up either side of the map depending on the number of players and special rules. Today I will play the extermination mission. So I place one random extermination token on two four, six, nine, and 10. Finally, place all the aliens and all eight bosses figures next to the board. Take the 25 event cards and you sort them out in order. Depending on the difficulty you've picked, refer to the table on page 10 of the rules and pick the cards you need for your difficulty level. I want to play medium difficulty, so I draw these cards. Shuffle the deck and place it face down in line near the map. That's your event track. Now you place the alien clusters. Shuffle the tokens and randomly place them on the alien clusters slots on the map, number face up. Also place the search tokens on the search slots on the map, light side face up. Place the remaining tokens near the map. Then the players decide who will be the timekeeper and you give that player the electronic timer. Now you are ready to start playing. The game is played over a maximum of eight rounds, and each round has five phases. Each round starts with the event phase. Reveal the leftmost or top card of the event track to discover the event of this round. There are three types of events. Cards 17 to 21 have no effect. Cards 22 to 25 are immediate effect events. They make you add one boss or one swarm spawn card or move aliens three spaces. The third type is only for medium and hard difficulty levels. They are ongoing effects. 
Cards 1 to 16 show effects that remain in play until resolved. These six slots list action dice you need to allocate during one round to resolve the event. The more heroes play, the more actions you need to resolve. Here, for a four-player game, we need to resolve these four. Then it's the alien spawning phase, which brings reinforcements to the aliens. These depend on the number of players and the difficulty level you chose. Check out the table on page 12 of the rules to see how many swarm spawn cards and how many boss spawn cards you draw. You first resolve the swarm spawn cards. If at any time you don't have enough swarm spawn cards to draw, reshuffle the discard pile and draw a new one. One card at a time, draw and spawn new alien swarms. Each card shows the type of swarm it is, biter, runner or shooter. At the bottom left, the number of minis you spawn. In the middle, it shows where it spawns. Spawn point number one, two or three. If there's a question mark instead of a number, the players agree collectively the spawn point where they want the new swarm. The minis are placed on the spaces surrounding the spawn point. If all locations are already occupied, the new arrivals push the aliens on the map. For instance here, all three spaces are occupied by shooters and four new biters are spawning here. You can place one biter here and push this shooter. It can move either here or here as aliens must move following the alien path shown by these arrows. Players collectively decide which figure to push and where it goes. You can push this one, which moves here, and pushes it again for the third biter, and the bite ends up here, and again for the fourth biter. If the aliens push a hero, the hero takes one damage. The hero doesn't need to follow the alien path. It can move in any direction except around wall corners. If a hero is pushed multiple times, it takes one damage for each push. A pushed mini can end up pushing another mini, so they all move. If a hero pushes another figure, it doesn't take or inflict any damage. If you need to spawn more swarms, but you don't have the required minis, move one mini for each missing alien. It doesn't matter the movement rate of the minis. They move one space for each missing alien. Sometimes one of the new swarms also activates. If the card shows this icon on the bottom right corner, the swarm activates. It performs its ability. Players choose the order in which specific swarms perform their abilities. Check the stat cards to see the ability the swarm can perform. Biters attack adjacent heroes. Roll one hit dice, the green one, for each attack. On a four or more, the hero takes one damage. If there's more than one hero targeted, players decide which hero takes the damage. Shooters attack any hero within three spaces. Like the biters, they hit on a four or more. Runners don't have any special ability. All alien swarms, which were activated, now get to perform their full movement. The movement of each alien is shown on the bottom right. Shooters move one space, biters two, and runners move three spaces. After the activation and movement of the swarms, draw the first boss card from the top of the boss spawn deck. If the card is an all clear card, it's discarded with no effect. If it's a boss card, find the corresponding figure and place it on the map. Roll a hit die. On one or two, place it near alien cluster token one, on three or four near token two, and five or six near token three. Pushing rules also apply. Place health tokens on the boss's card equal to the number on the bottom left corner. All bosses activate when they spawn. So now it's time to resolve the boss's ability. Gutslug spawns one swarm card near itself. These two make aliens move. These three damage heroes within range. Naga and Dreadspit respectively place one slime or one acid token in an adjacent space. Each space can have a maximum of one acid and one slime at a time. Aliens ignore acid token, but heroes take one damage when they enter that space. Heroes ignore slime tokens, but aliens move one extra space when they enter that space. In medium and hard mode, you draw a second boss. Resolve it the same way. After all the bosses have been placed on the map and their abilities resolved, they perform their full movement, also shown on the bottom right side of their card. Now, it's the super exciting action phase where the heroes take all their actions and movements. When you are ready to start it, the action phase must be completed within a given time. In that time, players make individual decisions, and once taken, they cannot be changed, no matter what the outcome. That's what builds so much tension in this phase and why it's so much fun. The timekeeper uses the electronic timer and sets it to the standard action phase duration of two minutes. Some game circumstances can change that, and the timekeeper sets the timer accordingly.
During that time, players roll their dice to perform different actions. Keep your action and hit dice close to you. Once everyone is ready, the timekeeper starts the timer and players begin rolling their action dice. There are six types of results. This side is for movements. For each result, the hero can move one space in any of eight directions. You cannot move diagonally to wall corners or to walls. You cannot go through, push or be pushed blocking spaces. Blocking spaces are spaces that don't have grid lines on all sides. Also, heroes cannot move through spaces already occupied by another hero or aliens unless they are pushed. This magnifying glass is to search for items. If your hero is adjacent to or on the light side of a search token and rolls one magnifying glass, you can perform one of two things. The first option is to draw the top three cards of the search deck. Choose one to keep. There are three types of search cards, attachments, items, and weapons. Weapons work like basic weapons. They are just better. Some have special effects and some have an infinite range. Attachments add permanent bonuses to your weapon's range, number of hit dice, or reducing the hit value. There are also five types of items, which also give you or your weapons additional bonuses once they are activated. Unlike weapons, there's no limit to the number of items your hero can carry. Items go on the right side of your board. Attachments are added to one of your weapons. You can add a maximum of one attachment to the attack of the weapon and add one to the range. Attachments are permanent. Once attached to a weapon, they remain until the end of the game with the weapon, even when traded or discarded. Also, if there's a yellow and black line here or here, you cannot add this type of attachment to this weapon. And these weapons have both marked, so they can never be upgraded. Another difference between items and attachments is how you use them. Attachments have a constant passive effect, while items are like weapons. You need to activate them to use them. To activate an item or a weapon, you need to place matching action dice on the dice slots. When you roll one of these four allocate icons, you can place one die on the matching slot. Once the slots are full, you activate the item. Extra damage, movement, resistance, weapon activation or healing. The difference between the blue and the red slots is that once you've activated the blue slots, you get your dice back and can use them for the rest of the action phase. Dice you use to activate red dice slots stay there until the end of the action phase. Once you've picked your item, attachment or weapon, discard the other two and flip the search token face down. Now, because of all this takes a bit of time, there's a faster option to handle search. In this option, immediately take the search token and place it near your hero board. At the end of the action phase, for each search token you have, you draw the top three cards of the search deck, choose one to keep and discard the other two. Then return the search token light side up to the map. We've seen that these three sides are to allocate actions on special items, but it's also what you use to activate your weapons. Once your weapon is activated with the right allocated dice, you roll the number of hit dice shown here. In this case, two dice. All results equal or greater than the hit value shown here, you generate one hit. Assign the hit to any alien figure within the range shown here. Unless you're in the starting area, in which case you only ever have a range of one, you also need to have line of sight. To measure line of sight, draw an imaginary line from the center of your space to the center of your target space. This line must not be interrupted by any blocking element preventing line of sight, like trees, water, walls, or any space that doesn't have grid lines on all sides. Note that alien and hero figures are not considered blocking elements and therefore do not block line of sight. Also, line of sight is not blocked if it only skims a blocking corner or passes at an angle exactly through the intersection of four spaces where only one side is blocked. If you roll multiple hits, you choose how to assign them either on one figure or multiple ones. Swarms only have one life, so they get killed after one hit. If you hit a boss, return one of the health tokens for each hit it takes. If an alien's health is reduced to zero, the alien is killed. Remove the figure from the map. If it's a swarm, place it back in the reserve. If you kill a boss, return its card and figure to the game box instead. For each boss you kill, draw the top two cards from the alien tech deck. The alien tech goes to the player who reduced the boss's health to zero, not those who might have done previous damage. Alien tech cards are special weapons and items. You can either choose one alien tech to equip immediately and discard the other. Alternatively, 
to save time, you can set aside the two cards face down in front of you and wait until the end of the action phase to select one. Once you've assigned all the hits, take back all the dice allocated to the weapon's regular slots. You can roll them again normally. During the action phase, you can choose to allocate any number of dice, spend them to resolve an action or re-roll them as you see fit. If your weapon has a locking slot and you activate it, your die remains on it until the end of the round and you can reuse it by reallocating a die on the regular slot. You have to resolve the result of the red icon before re-rolling or resolving any other action. That's the alien movement action and that's not good. Choose any alien figure to move exactly one space following the alien movement path. Even runners and biters only move one space, not their full movement. If you roll more than one alien movement, you choose how to distribute them between one or multiple aliens. If, as a result, the alien enters a space occupied by another, it will push it. If you play Kara, you don't always move the aliens. Instead, she can use one of her six ability tokens to cancel a move. Make sure no alien moves into the starting area, or you will lose the game. If at any time a die rolls off the table, the timekeeper stops the timer and players cannot take actions or discuss their plans. When all the dice are back on the table, the action phase continues. Another action players should also focus on is resolving events. Players may allocate matching action dice to resolve events. When all the action slots on an ongoing event card have action dice locked on them, the ongoing event is fulfilled. Its effects cease to affect the game, its card is removed from the game immediately, and players retrieve their action dice. Heroes can be anywhere on the map to resolve the event. However, they must be adjacent to a mission token to allocate matching action dice onto the mission token slots. When the timer reaches zero, the timekeeper announces that time's up and all players stop rolling action dice. Your leftover action dice results are discarded, except alien movement rolls. Then you can activate each ready equipment. Unresolved ongoing events continue to affect the game. Now is also a good time to check and discard your search items and or the alien tech you kept aside. You can trade at any time during the action phase, but now is your last chance. You need to be adjacent to another hero and with line of sight to each other to give or exchange equipment cards. You cannot trade equipment with any die allocated on them. Once you're done, you can move on to the alien activation phase. This is the phase when all the aliens perform their ability and then move. All aliens, type by type, perform the ability listed on the stat card for swarms or spawn cards or for bosses. If there are multiple effects supposed to take place at the same time, the players choose the order to resolve them. After that, players choose the order in which specific bosses or swarms perform their abilities. Biters attack all adjacent heroes, and then shooters attack all heroes within three spaces. All aliens of a specific swarm must resolve their action before another type is selected. Do the same thing for all bosses. As a result of these abilities, if a hero suffers damage, move its damage marker to the right on the damage track of a hero, one space to the right for each damage. If the damage marker cube crosses a damage threshold, the hero loses one action die and places it in the corresponding locked die slot. Die slot in that way can no longer be used until the hero is healed and his damage cube moves back beyond the respective damage threshold. If a hero's damage tracker cube reaches the damage track's rightmost space, that hero is killed and the game ends immediately in defeat. Finally, resolve any effect that takes place at the end of the alien ability phase takes place after all the other effects. Then the second part of the activation once all swarms and bosses have been activated, they move. The swarm stat card and the boss's spawn cards show the movement value from 1 to 4. Shooters move 1 space, biters 2 and runners move 3 spaces, and Ashar even moves 4 spaces. Players may move the alien figures in any order they wish. Aliens always follow the alien movement path printed on the map. If a space has multiple paths, players choose which to follow for the alien figure. Alien swarms and bosses can also push during this phase. If any alien figure moves into the elite starting area, the game is immediately over and the players have been defeated. Otherwise, once all alien figures have moved their full movement value, it's the end of the round. 
Retrieve all action dice, return search tokens light side face up on the search slots on the map, check for victory conditions. Successfully completing missions and returning to the elite starting area is the only way for players to win the game. Now, my tips to win at Project Elite are, this is a co-op game and pretty hectic at that. Make sure you plan your collective moves as a group and regroup after your action phase. Items and alien techs are better researched at the end of the action phase, so you have plenty of time to see what is best for you. You may choose to delay resolving the alien movements as long as you'd like, as long as you don't perform any other action in the meantime. Move shooters away from you and towards your base so they can't shoot you. Let a hero with a long range weapon take them down. At the end of the day, this is a game that's a lot of fun. Go with the flow, don't forget to have fun and have a blast. And that's how you play Project Elite. I think it's a very exciting cooperative game. The addition of the timer makes it hectic and very unique. And time just flies when you play it. I've had a lot of fun playing this game. If you've enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe. And if you enjoy my content, consider supporting me by becoming a YouTube member on Patreon or buy me a coffee. The links are in the video description. And if there's a game you would like me to teach, leave it in the comments. I'll definitely check it out. We'll make more games easy soon. Bye now.